Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More information available at smithville.net. Tonight on the weekly special, we're exploring some of the highlights of Indiana summer. From the record breaking drought and its effect on Indiana residents, to ongoing area conservation and sustainability efforts, plus the unique ways that Hoosiers are battling the blistering heat. All this and more right now on The Weekly Special. Thanks for joining us tonight, I'm Joe Wren. Well, this summer certainly has been one to remember, from the sky-high temperatures to the effects of the devastating drought. I had the opportunity just recently to tour with the Department of Agriculture official to take a look at some of the area farms to see how the drought has affected them. A sprinkle or two of rain falls over the drought-stricken Johnson County farm of Merrill Kelsey, Although welcomed, any relief now is likely too late. But it is stressful and, you, and you're worried about, you know, that, that you're going to be able to make it and make it work out. Kelsey's livelihood consists of 2,200 acres of wheat, hay, corn, and soybeans, and 500 head of dairy cows. Kelsey relieves his cattle from the heat with sprinklers and fans, but that's not an option for his crops. Lower yields may force him to buy extra feed. The problem is that trucking's high now because of the fuel rates and, and the trucking and, and the uh, availability is going to be, you're going to, you've got a lot of people looking for the last candy bar, you know what I mean. Indiana is ranked fifth nationally in corn production, giving the state the dubious distinction of being the worst hit by the drought. USDA Undersecretary Michael Skuse toured Kelsey's farm and a few others last month to survey the devastation. Looking at the drought monitor, it's probably as bad here in parts of Indiana as anywhere else in the country. Severe to exceptional drought conditions exist in nearly all of the state. More than 80 percent of Indiana has been declared a disaster area by the Federal Department of Agriculture. As of July 28th, Bloomington has received almost 16 inches less rainfall than is normal by this time of year. Terre Haute is 14 inches below average and Indianapolis 10 inches shy. Temperature records have broken too. July 2012 will go down in history as the warmest month of record at Indianapolis. The farm bill being considered in Congress could send billions less to farmers over the next 10 years. Skew says he hopes the drought will persuade Congress to nix any cuts to the insurance program and pass the bill to offer some immediate relief. Uh, I think some of our, our uh, tra traditional lending institutions, our bankers, uh, would like to know what's in a bill if they're going to make the loans to our producers that have faced uh, the, the losses that they're facing. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we need a bill f uh, for all of those reasons and it needs to be done fairly quickly. In the meantime, while drought and temperature records break, all the farmers can do is wait and hope for a better season next year. Just last Wednesday, federal economic injury disaster loans were made available as a result of the drought. For more information, visit www.sba.gov. Conservation efforts are not unfamiliar in southern Indiana, such as here at Bean Blossom Bottoms Nature Preserve, Hoosiers have worked hard to preserve Indiana's natural beauty. One such place has gotten national attention and is the subject of the latest WTIU documentary. Here's a sneak peek. Oh, a couple times a week, I'd go, about sunset, I'd drive down through the goose pond and, and just see the birds and the, the sun reflecting off the water. It's a really a pretty scenery. It's just so inspiring to go down there and see these birds are so magnificent and I was so excited. I like going down the side roads where they have a little open areas that you can drive up into and then you can walk up over the ridge and then you can see the, the birds and stuff in the water. You can see a lot of species that you don't normally see around here and uh, I think it's great. We all came out here to see the sunrise because this is the best spot to see it.
When Indiana became a state in 1816, there were over 200 million acres of wetlands in the United States. Considered useless for farming, Congress passed the Swampland Act of 1850 that encouraged settlers to dredge, drain, and tile their waterlogged areas and convert them into farmland. One of the requirements of the Swampland Act was that the owner of the land, which was usually a farmer, was that they drained the land and they started using clay tiles. A lot of it was uh, local clay way back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Clay tile had the little gap and then the next tile would be laid here about a quarter of an inch. That's where the water would get in and go downstream. In Indiana, over a million acres of wetlands were drained. This resulted in the decline of several wetland-dependent species, like the great egret. The destruction of the wetlands occurred at such a rate that by the mid-1970s, less than half the wetlands in the continental United States remained. The importance wetlands have in helping to improve water quality, control flooding, reduce erosion, and create wildlife habitats for migratory animals was finally widely recognized, and many of the Swampland Act's provisions were reversed. Wetland conservation became a priority. One of the success stories that resulted is the 8,000-acre Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area in southern Indiana the largest wetland restoration project of its kind in U.S. history. But it wasn't an easy journey. It would take years as the tireless passion of a few struggled to make it happen. And it may have all just been worth it. For more information on Goose Pond, the story of a wetland, visit www.indianapublicmedia.org backslash goosepod. And be sure to tune in on Wednesday, August 22nd at 8 p.m. for the premiere. From the large-scale restoration of Goose Pond to the backyard efforts of our next subject, passion seems to be a driving force, although a little bit slower. If you look in Marty LaPrise's backyard, you'll see turtles, turtles, and more turtles. LaPrise has turned her new Palestine home into a nonprofit turtle and tortoise sanctuary, rehabilitation center, education facility, and conservatory called Indiana Turtle Care. When I really got involved, I had two box turtles, and people started finding out that I had these box turtles, and this was before the internet. So there wasn't much information. So I started reading and, and learning and things, and people would call me out of the clear blue and say, I hear that you know a little bit about turtles. Could you help me with this? And I thought, you know, I think I'm, I'm gonna really take the next step want a tomato. She is now a licensed turtle and tortoise rehabilitator and works with local veterinarians, rescue organizations, like and the Department of Natural Resources to rehabilitate the injured creatures. <laughs> Don't they look like E.T.? <laughs> LaPrise is one of the only turtle and tortoise rehabilitators in the area, so she receives a number of hurt, sick, and even confiscated turtles. LaPrise says she does a lot of shell repair on turtles that have been run over by a car or lawnmower or were bitten by a dog. These turtles and tortoises stay inside where they can receive the proper attention. With turtles, they take a long time to heal. It's not like a, a, a deer or a raccoon, you know, and they hurt themselves and they heal. But turtles take a long time to heal. So if they survive a trauma to the shell, um, if it's just a split, then I tend to wire it together. If there's individual pieces, some of them may not be viable. So I wait to see if they're gonna, if I can somehow put them together. I may have to remove some pieces. This is what happened to Penelope, a turtle found hit by a car on the streets of Indianapolis. Luckily, 
it, she was found by the vet at the, at the zoo and she took her in and worked on her and her whole side was gone. And they entrusted me to, to take her. Um, made me very nervous because they worked so hard and I thought, oh boy, that, you know, these are the veterinarians at the zoo. Amazingly, Penelope survived with only a part of her side missing. She now swims among a number of other turtles and is sometimes referred to as our miracle girl. And she's doing great. The Laprises also have two Salcutta tortoises that are allowed to roam freely in the backyard because they've outgrown their prior habitats. Laprise's husband, John, says Oglethorpe, who weighs between 20 and 25 pounds, is very trusting of his new home. Uh, he follows you around, he knows his name, and when the weather is bad, he knows to go in uh, to an enclosure where it's safe. John says he has seen a big change in these turtles and tortoises' demeanor the longer they stay. You get a turtle in from the wild, and after a few days of giving it attention, it's amazing how it lets down its defenses and trusts you. And the ones that have been here for a long time, how they come up and greet you just like a dog. You can have just the worst day and, and just come out and just kind of watch them, you know, and in the mornings come out with a cup of coffee and because they're waking up, they like the sun and they're busy and it's, calming. And we'd like to remind everyone at home that keeping turtles as pets is highly regulated in the state of Indiana. For information about turtle care, what you should do if you find a turtle, healthy or otherwise, and to learn more about the turtles and tortoises in Marty and John's care, visit IndianaTurtleCare.com. Certainly, Indiana's turtles seem to be coping well this summer, but what about the exotic animals? Pam Thrash has the story from the Indianapolis Zoo. Most Hoosiers have found fun ways to battle the blistering temperatures. But for some of Indiana's more unique residents, the hot summer has been particularly tricky. Luckily for them, the keepers at the Indianapolis Zoo have some creative solutions, including a longtime favorite in the summer sun, popsicles. Even African animals, all animals have a, a heat tolerance just like we do. So it's just something to keep them cool. They're outside. I mean, they're smarter than we are. They stay in the shade. They stay. They know where it's cooler. But we need to find other ways to keep them cool. So ice is perfect. It lasts a long time. It's just like us eating popsicles just, or ice cream cones just to keep us cool during the day. It's the same, same premise. It's fun to watch them just kind of try to negotiate how they're supposed to get to the food, especially when it's a treat this large. And you'll see and there's a, a hierarchy. So, you know, the dominant animals will usually come and get the first crack at it. And all the other ones will literally sit in a circle and surround him and watch and wait for him to lose interest and move off so then they can all jump in and, and get what's left. So it's fun to see how they interact with it. That's just probably one of my favorite things to see is, is them playing with it. While the baboon treats look good enough to eat, the same can't be said for the lion popsicles. Bloodsicles, to be more exact. Zuri! Zuri! Let's see how good I can throw. Oh! <laughs> I hope you got that on film. There he goes. I think Nyack sees it now. Nyack, good boy. Of course, you can't have treats for the lions without giving some treats to the tigers and bears, too. Over at the Brown Bear Exhibit, keepers add special toppings to the icy desserts. Sometimes it's not this elaborate with the peanut butter and honey, and we change it up a bit. Sometimes we just throw the blocks of ice in the water and let them play in the water with them. So anything that has a lot of hair that is built for Alaska or the cooler regions, we try to give them uh, something special to keep them cool through this time of the year. 
Now hopefully she'll keep this ice tree up and not roll it into the uh, area. Oh no! Oh no! Oh! She lost some of her ice treats. It's a good thing we refreeze them and make more. She'll probably get another one today. For the zoo's largest inhabitants, the African elephants, the task of staying cool becomes quite a bit bigger. They are well adapted for hot climates and they're actually pretty flexible in their parameters for which they can be outdoors. They thermoregulate by flapping their ears and that cools the blood vessels down that are in their ears and that cooler blood then circulates to the rest of their body and can cool their whole body down. But they do not sweat like we do. That would take way too much water to cool a big elephant down. And on hot days, like we've had plenty of, we will make a special treat just for the elephants to help keep them cool. It's one of the many things we do to help keep the elephants cool. And then use her foot to smash it into manageable pieces that she can put in her mouth if she can, which is not too challenging when you're 8,000 pounds to smash something, I guess. And as the elephants get too hot, they will suck up water in their trunk and throw it on themselves. Or they'll use the mud wallow that's near the back of this part of the exhibit. And in fact, they'll even just lay right down in it. So a good layer of mud will help keep that heat off of their skin directly and act like a sunscreen as well as keeping the heat off. And it will also keep the bugs off as well. The elephant's wrinkles may be a sign of wisdom, but they actually serve to hold the mud in place which makes their daily bath particularly challenging. And Jill's going to start the bath off by offering Tommy a drink of water. An adult elephant can hold two to three gallons of water in his trunk at a time, and they may drink in this hot weather 40 or more gallons of water a day. Tommy is pretty clean to start with today, but if they've just gone out and got a bunch of mud on themselves, it might take us 20 minutes or close to half an hour even. The bathing session for us allows us to give the elephants a thorough inspection all over their whole body. So we're going to look at their eyes, their ears, their mouth, their trunk, their tail, all along their back. It also is going to help keep them clean but exfoliate any overgrown skin. We'll check for any scrapes or lumps or bumps or bugs that might get, get on them. And it also acts as a training session for us. So Jill is asking Tommy for behavior. She's rewarding those behaviors when Tommy performs them like she wants. So it's a multifaceted thing for us. And it also helps cool them off in, the, in hot weather too. And if their skin gets too dry, we'll give them a moisturizing treatment as well. And we'll use mineral oil. It takes about five gallons of mineral oil to completely cover an adult elephant. In the past, we had used a power sprayer to apply that. Now we just use giant paint rollers. And that has seemed like it's worked the best and been the most efficient to get coverage on an elephant. Before heading back into the yard and mud once again, each elephant's bath time is capped with a special iced treat. <laughs> what better way to cool off than a nice cold watermelon? Well, the animals have found a way to stay cool, and many Indiana residents have also found a way to stay cool right here at Oliver Winery. Did you know that you can learn how to make wine at home? Check out this next segment. I started making wine probably in the 70s. Back then, you could just buy the kits, and frankly, they really weren't too good. The kits they make now are excellent very good and uh, it just progressed from that. But even though the kits got better, Mike wasn't quite satisfied. I always wanted to make wine from the fresh fruit, the actual grapes. So he considered his options, which included purchasing juice or must from one of Indiana's commercial wineries. I have bought from Beasley, they're excellent. They have some very good grapes and they'll also sell you the juice, which makes it a lot easier. You don't have to go out and pick them and and process it. But even that wasn't going to do the trick. Mike and his partner Mary wanted to get their hands dirty. So I thought it'd be a natural put in some vines. And so the little used hay field on his southern Indiana property became Maria Luisa Vineyard. Originally 
contacted a nursery in New York, AA Vineyards, that sells one-year-old vines. We got a tractor and a plow, plowed it up, put the vines in, and of course it takes three years to start to get grapes off the vine. So in the first three years, it was mainly chopping the weeds down, trying to keep the vines alive, watering the vines, and pruning them, and putting in all the posts and the trellises. It was a lot of work, a lot of work, it, but it was uh, working outdoors and it was a lot of fun. But all that work has paid off. Maria Luisa Vineyard now has more than a thousand vines producing grapes. And while that may seem like a lot, it takes a lot of grapes to make wine about three to four pounds of fruit for each bottle. But even with Mike and Mary using everything they want for their own vintages, there's plenty left over for other home winemaking enthusiasts to come pick their own. These are our Traminette. It makes a wonderful white wine, and they're looking very good this year, even though they came through the frost. And then over here, this is more the Indiana native grape. These are Catawba. And it, it makes a, a nice light wine. But a lot of the locals around here will pick it and make jams and jellies out of it. So it's good for that. The other type of grape that we grow is the Foch. This is a small hybrid French type grape. But in the fall of the year, these will get black. They'll get real dark. Excellent for making wine and it gives the wine a good dark red color. And if the harvest is especially good, Mike even sells to local commercial wineries. Because the vineyard has gotten so big, we're over 1,200 vines right now, we have extra capacity. So we do haul grapes to wineries. Mallow Run up in Indianapolis buys from us. Also, this uh, winery down in Elizabethtown buys from us. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme, let me put it that way. It's a lot of work. Uh, the reward is in the grapes, your own grapes. That's why people like to bake bread or cook their own food. It's just a, a neat thing to do. Cheers. Wow, and for those of us who don't make our own wine, we're so lucky to have so many Indiana wineries nearby. Now to get a better look at how the professionals do it, you won't want to miss the latest documentary from WTIU. Here's a preview. Indiana wines have fresh, fruity, floral notes. They're light and enjoyable. We have sweet red wines, we have dry white wines, uh, we have excellent fruit wines. I don't know, we'll try it all. <laughs> I mean, really. But we like this, to support local. But we do, we do like, like to support, support local. local. In Indiana, we tend to like the sweeter wines versus the dry, but... It's just fun to be able to buy stuff from your own state and something to be proud of. I think the best thing about Indiana wines are the people who make the wines. They're a fun group of people. I love my job. It's, it's, I love what I do for a living. Couldn't be more blessed. I come to work as happy as I go home. The wines available to the public are much, much better than they were 40 years ago. There's a wide selection and you have to run to keep up. Our goal is 45 minutes from the time the grape is picked to it's in the destemmer. A lot of Hoosiers will, will testify that Indiana wine wasn't the best 20 years ago. Uh, now they're winning medals all the time. The Wine Council does the Indy International Wine Competition. It's uh, probably the largest wine competition outside of California, probably one of the top three in the country now. When a winery from anywhere uh, gets a gold medal from Indy, uh, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, one Indiana winery won uh, the best rosé wine of the entire competition last year. Uh, one won the, the best white wine of the entire competition. So those are big successes. And we kind of joke that if Indiana had a state pie, um, then, then we could be known for a wine too. They had to find a grape that you could grow from north to south, and we had to find a grape that uh, produced good wines. So Traminette is our signature grape. Traminette is a white wine, very similar to a Gewürztraminer. People now hear Traminette and they think Indiana. I've seen the palate evolve. Now people are drinking Traminettes and, and you know wines that were never really heard of. So it's changing. It's definitely changing. Vintage Indiana is the biggest wine festival in the state. 10,000 people come and enjoy a day and really get an education about wines. So I'm just here to learn and taste some stuff and have a good time. Because we absolutely love it. We've been here, what, like eight years in a row? In a row. We just enjoy the Indiana wines and we like some of the fruit wines and we love Indiana, Indiana wine. wine. Indiana 
one is awesome. I had no idea they're so nice. I didn't either. For more information on the upcoming documentary, Hoosier Hospitality Wine, visit www.indianapublicmedia.org and be sure to tune in on August 19th at 8.30 p.m. to watch the premiere. And that's all the time we have for tonight's show. Thanks for watching the weekly special and stay cool. Smithville, a local provider of fiber optic based internet, TV, and phone services. Smithville's quantum fiber optic network allows large amounts of data to travel around the world from local homes and businesses. More information available at smithville.net.